The scripture reading this morning is from Mark chapter 1, verses 29 to 39. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed by demons, and the whole city gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not let the demons speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. He answered, let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. <clears throat> May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Perhaps this has happened to you. You have a phone call to make or paper to write, or project to finish, or some other thing that you're working on. An important call today. Something that you're a little nervous about, so you've been putting it off, and putting it off, and putting it off until today. You decide, nope, today is the day. Enough is enough. Today, I am going to take the bull by its horns and call. And so, after completing your vocal diction, lips, teeth, tip of the tongue, <clears throat> you sit down at your desk and prepare yourselves mentally, emotionally, spiritually for this important call you are about to make. You breathe in and you breathe out. And as you reach for the phone, you notice the state of your desk. You say to yourself, self, I can't make an important call like this with such a messy desk. And so you clean first the top, then the drawers, then the wood itself. And after a solid hour and a half or so of dusting and polishing and waxing the desk, you are finally ready to make that important call. Lips, teeth, tip of the tongue. You prepare yourself mentally, emotionally, spiritually again and reach out for the phone when you feel a little grumble in your stomach. All of this cleaning has made you hungry. And so you go and fix yourself something to eat and then eat it and then clean your plate, and then clean out the dishwasher, and then clean the kitchen, and then sweep the floors, and then eventually make your way back to your desk, lips, teeth, tip of the tongue, prepare yourself mentally, emotionally, spiritually, only to realize you're thirsty. Now you're annoyed. You run to the kitchen, you grab your glass of water, fill it up, grabbing a coaster, because you don't want to mess up your newly waxed desk. You set out your drink, you sit down, to prepare yourself, lips, teeth, tip of the tongue, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. You reach out to make that phone call you've been avoiding only to realize it's way too late to call. So you check your email. <laughs> distractions, distractions. Friends, we live in a world in which there are no ends to our distractions. 
Some of them are very productive distractions, but as if email or voicemail or texting or Facebook or Twitter or whatever else creative creatively we come up with to distract ourselves, as if those weren't enough, we come up with new ways each and every day. Now, some of it is okay. We have probably each been at a point in our lives at some point where we needed a little distraction. We've probably all been someplace where we thought, thank goodness for this distraction. The problem comes, as we know, when our distractions make us forget what we were doing in the first place. The problem comes when our distractions keep us from our mission, from what we came here to do. Fortunately for us, this is nothing new. Today we hear a story from the very beginning of Mark's gospel, from the very beginning of the ministry of Jesus in which we encounter a distracted Jesus. A Jesus who has discovered all of the different things that he can do, but he spent so much time focusing on what he could do that he's forgotten what he should do. He has lost focus of his mission and is trying to find his way again. The scripture lesson picks up just after we left off last week. We might remember that Jesus had been teaching all day in the synagogue and even took a moment to cast out a demon. Now, for clarification's sake, because it comes up again later in our passage, we should just take a moment to acknowledge that most likely... When our scripture refers to someone who is possessed by a demon, they're referring to a first century understanding of mental illness. That they didn't have a means by which to diagnose someone as mentally ill, and so they said that person was possessed by a demon. And as anyone who has ever faced mental illness can attest, it's not such a bad comparison. So Jesus has been spending all day working, teaching, trying to help people who were coming to him, and the text implies that he is ready to crash at a friend's house. We're told that he enters the house of Simon and Andrew, and right away he's told that Simon's mother-in-law has a fever. Now, we wouldn't blame Simon for wanting to help his mother-in-law. After all, one doesn't stay married long if one doesn't learn to respect one's mother-in-law. Trust me. <laughs> but Jesus was under no obligation to help. Jesus likely wanted to just sit back and put his feet up. After a long day, he wanted to come home and finally rest. But when he got there, there was something else he needed to do. That's the way it goes in life sometimes. Sometimes it's after a long, busy day that we just want to end, that we come home to be confronted with some situation that we were not prepared for and which we really don't want to deal with right now. The kitchen's on fire, yes, but can't it wait till tomorrow? That's the way life goes sometimes. But to his credit, Mark tells us that Jesus doesn't complain. He simply goes to Simon's mother-in-law, takes her by the hand, and her fever leaves. To be clear, it doesn't say that he healed her. It just says he took her by the hand, lifted her up, and her fever left. How? We don't know. 
Maybe he was holding her hand for a long time, as in until her fever left. We don't know. And frankly, to focus so much on the fever part makes us forget the much more scandalous part for the readers in the first century. That is, they were very used to hearing healing stories. Those came up frequently. What they were much less used to was hearing stories in which, prepare yourselves, a man and a woman were holding hands. Are you okay? Now, in our world of distractions, like Fifty Shades of Grey, it might seem cute to us that a culture was scandalized by two people holding hands, but friends, for them, it mattered. For them to see a man and a woman holding hands was not appropriate, and even more inappropriate was the fact that they weren't related, and on top of that, the fact that she was sick. Jesus going to this woman, holding her hand when she was sick, made him unclean. It was against the law. It was against the Torah. It was against Scripture. And yet he took the risk, as he does so often throughout his ministry. When he's confronted with a choice between the law or love, he chooses love. When he's confronted with the law or love, he chooses love. Love. Perhaps Mark was trying to remind us that in those moments in our life when we are confronted with confusion between what Scripture seems to tell us to do and what we know God has called us to do, we ought to err on the side of love. Jesus looks past the taboos, past the cultural indignation that would come with it, and he goes to the woman to hold her hand. He doesn't just see her as a woman who is ill, but as a child of God. In other words, he greets her with grace. And her response is to serve. Now, full disclosure, this passage has been used throughout the Christian centuries as a way of saying women should submit to men. This is a passage that has been used to say that what Jesus did was to restore this woman to her appropriate place in the household, and that was in service to men, in submission to men. But friends, to understand the passage this way is not only dangerous, it's wrong. This is not a passage about how women should be submissive to men. No, it's a passage how one woman responded to grace. That's what this is about. It's not about submitting to a man in this relationship that is a dangerous understanding. Ironically, it's the same dangerous understanding that is purported by Fifty Shades of Grey, right? The problem is love, real love, is not about one person dominating another person. Love, real love, is about both people submitting to each other. Do you see the difference? That's what makes it so hard. But the truth is, even if we were able to really grasp that, we still have to deal with this other part, the fever having left. The truth is, when we hear amazing tales like this throughout our Gospels, it leaves us scratching our heads a bit. When we hear these miraculous tales of Jesus healing the leper or the blind person or those people who are suffering, this woman with a fever, we say to ourselves, we have people who are sick. We have people who are blind. We have people who are in desperate need of help. And yet, why are they left to rot? We look around our world filled with ISIS and terrorists and challenges, and we ask, what gives God? We ask that question that has been asked since the very beginning of our faith, why do bad things happen to good people? Why is there suffering in our world? Why do I suffer? But as we've had to learn the hard way, friends, it doesn't work that way. Part of the freedom that God gives us to live in this world means that sometimes we will suffer. 
God doesn't have hands or feet in this world save for our hands and feet. We are the people who are called to reach out in love to our neighbors. We are the people who are called to try to heal where we can, to fix the brokenness in our world. And there are times when we will fail. But the good news, friends, is that there will be times when we succeed. But we will never succeed if we don't try. Remember how the story ends for Jesus. What began in the nativity ended at the cross. That's the scandal of this, that Jesus himself suffered, and God suffered alongside him. The promise of our faith is not that we won't suffer. We will. The promise is that none of us suffer alone. We are not alone. And we can face an awful lot if we know we don't have to face it alone. When the town hears that the fever has left Simon's mother-in-law, they make a line at the front door of Simon's house. And we're told that all night long, Jesus saw person after person after person after person, and he healed and he cured mental illness, and he worked with those people all night and all day until the morning came when suddenly he realized, I can't do this anymore. He must have realized that if he spent all of his time in this one town with this one set of people with their one set of problems, he would be ignoring all of the other problems of the world, that it wouldn't be what he came here to do, that he wouldn't be accomplishing his mission, that if he focused on this one town and tried to relieve their suffering, the rest of the world would suffer. And so Jesus did what we so often struggle to do. What we so often fail to do without making ourselves feel guilty. He took a moment to himself. He took a moment to himself. He stepped away. The text tells us that he went to a deserted place so that he could pray, so that he could stop what he was doing long enough to remember why he was here in the first place, to remember what his mission was. He took the time to step away. We all long for a moment to step away, don't we? We might remember that young single mother who wants nothing more than a break. We might remember the doctor who's been on call for 24 hours, who needs a nap. We might remember all of the children and teachers who are longing for a snow day tomorrow. Sometimes, friends, we need a break. The challenge is, in life, we often confuse our distractions with breaks and our breaks with distractions. But we need to stop. Because it's only when we have that moment to connect with God and to ourselves that we remember what it means to really live. It's only in that moment when we step away from all of the distractions that we can finally remember why we are here in the first place. At some point, we need to put down our phones, to turn off our email, to not check our Facebook, to stop responding to texts and just be human beings. And if we're worried that our distractions won't be there when we get back, they will. But if we wait until we check everything off of our to-do list, we will be waiting forever. Sometimes we think that we're God, that we can just go and go, but the truth is we're not. And the, frankly, even if we were, we would still need to stop. And on the seventh day, God rested. The chaos will be there when we're done. But we 
will be able to see it differently. Jesus found a way to get away by himself. To take a moment. And the chaos followed. In our story, the disciples come and find Jesus after who knows how long. And they say to Jesus, everybody is looking for you. In our world today, it might be, we've been texting you for hours. Where are you? They want to pull him right back in. But because Jesus has taken a moment to himself, he's able to respond. He doesn't just, like we are sometimes apt to do, decide to just jump right back into it. No, instead, he has re focused on his mission. He says, no, let us go into the neighboring town so that I can share my message with them, for that is what I came out to do. Let us go into the neighboring town so that I can share my message with them, for that is what I came out to do. Friends, what did we come out to do? And what is keeping us from it? If it's a distraction, then perhaps it's time to let it go. Perhaps it's time to take a moment as individuals, as a congregation, as a world to just stop and to remember why God has called us here. The truth is we could spend all day avoiding a call or we could pause long enough to remember that sometimes God calls us. And if we're willing to answer, we will find life. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. Will there be distractions? Yes. And part of life is figuring out our way through them. It's not easy, but on the other side is life. Fortunately, we have Jesus as an example. Somehow, in the midst of all the chaos, of all the pressure of what he was called to do, Jesus found a way to step away from it all, to stop worrying about today so that he could focus on the hope of tomorrow, so that he could pause long enough from the chaos of life so that he could actually focus on what he was called to do. He stopped so that he could share the message of hope, of love, of life with the world. Fortunately for us, he didn't have email. Thanks be to God. Amen.